Hey guys, welcome back. Joe Brunsman, Insurance Broker of the Stars. Tonight, how to lose a million dollars with your cyber application or lessons from the Travelers vs. ICS Inc. lawsuit that is currently ongoing. So these are allegations, uh, but I think it's very important because a lot of people out there have misconceptions about what is it that insurance companies do to deny coverage. So this is going to be one aspect of that. Now, in December of 2020, ICS, hey, their server was compromised. They used the uh, username and password for the administrator, and that resulted in ransomware. Now, fast forward about a year and a half, that ICS server once again compromised, this time with the Xeon ransomware string. So six days later, ICS notifies their cyber insurance company, in this case, Travelers, that they have ransomware. That's an issue. So travelers begins to investigate now it's worth kind of taking a pause here and saying part of every cyber insurance contract and really i think every insurance contract as far as i've ever seen it is you have to assist with the investigation right you can't stonewall information um, a lot of this information has to go through uh, the appointed attorney anyways so in some circumstances it may behoove you uh, if you're a business with a cyber policy to have your own attorney on this side to assist you with this kind of stuff but suffice to say, nine times out of 10, the insurance company is going to figure this stuff out. So what are they looking at? Well, there's a whole complaint uh, that's out there, many, many pages long. But this is kind of the important part. This is really the crux of the matter here. So you'll see in front of you this multi-factor authentication, also known as MFA, attestation. So they're essentially attesting to something here. And... Why do I think this was put on? I think it's because, hey, they had a previous cyber event. And so now the cyber insurance company is going, hey, you know what? Um, we don't want to pay for that again. So we're going to have this additional level of scrutiny that's going to be placed upon the insured. So what do they say here? Hey, MFA required for all employees when accessing email through a website or cloud-based service. Okay, that makes sense. MFA required for all remote access to the network provided to employees, contractors, and third-party service providers. So if you're a uh, MSP watching this, that is something that you should take a look at. You're gonna be part of this process. Uh, also, if you're a company and you have, uh, let's say a VPN going on and RDP, uh, that is going to be crucial here. Number three, in addition to remote access, multi-factor authentication is required for the following, including such access provided to third-party service providers generally going to be an MSP there. So you'll see there's a whole laundry list of stuff right here. All internal remote admin access to directory services, Active Directory, LDAP, etc., network backup environments, network infrastructure, including firewalls, routers, switches, etc. Not as easy as it sounds. This is something where I think your business, if you have a cyber policy, you need to start planning ahead for this because that's not just something that you do in a day. It's not something where you just call your MSP and you're like, hey, I need this done. Hey, I need you to attest to this. They're going to have to check up on that because there's some potential liability on their end as well. And then, of course, internal and remote admin access to the organization's endpoint servers. And then you'll see this kind of interesting little line on the bottom here. The signer of this form has done so with the assistance of the person in charge of IT security. Now, why do you think a cyber insurance company would want that box checked? Uh, I'll let you just ruminate on that for a little while. All right, now let's talk about the investigation death spiral. What happened? These are the allegations made by travelers. In the course of their investigation in 2022, travelers first learned that at the time, the company in question completed and submitted the application documents. One, once again, allegations. MFA was not being utilized to protect the server. Kind of important because that's the allegation of what the very first ransomware event was back in 2020. And two, ICS only utilized MFA to protect its firewall and did not use MFA to protect any other digital asset. Now, if we just go back, remember down here, backup environments, directory services, fires, routers, switches, uh, endpoints and servers, specifically servers right there. They specifically asked about this. So continuing, per travelers, what they're saying to the court, hey, because MFA was not being utilized, right? Statements that the company made 
in the application were misrepresentations. We're going to talk about that here in a sec. Remember that word. Omissions and concealments of fact and incorrect statements made in applying for the policy. Had travelers been made aware that they were not using MFA to the extent represented in the application, travelers would not have issued the policy. Now, that's an interesting line. They're saying, hey, we think these guys effectively lied on their application. If we knew that they didn't do all the stuff they said they were doing, we never would have issued this policy to begin with. So what really brings trouble here? What was that misrepresentation? Well, in an insurance contract, a material misrepresentation, that's the insurance term or maybe the legal term you could say, occurs when the insured makes an untrue statement that is material to the acceptance of risk. So you can see where Travelers is pointing back to this and would have changed the rate at which the insurance company, so effectively how much they would have charged them or changed the insurer's decision to issue the contract. So if we just go back here, they're saying, hey, these guys lied to us effectively. And if we would have known this, we never would have issued this policy. Now, would they have issued the policy? Would it have been at a higher dollar amount? Uh, who's to know? But that's the allegation the Travelers is making. So the remedy upon discovery of a material misrepresentation is rescission of the policy. Rescission. Now, you guys have probably heard declined coverage, declination of coverage. You Maybe you're not super familiar with rescission. If anybody wants to know, this is from... Uh, the Journal of Insurance Regulation, uh, if you're a nerd like me and you read this kind of stuff. So what is Traveler saying here? As a result of the material misrepresentation, we looked at that in the application documents, the court should rescind the policy, declare that there is no coverage for any losses, costs, or claims submitted by the company to Travelers for coverage under the policy, including this latest ransomware event. So what is policy rescission? This is more than a declination. Effectively, what they're saying is, hey, these guys broke the contract. The contract is null and void, right? We are going to move forward um, under the auspices of the fact that, or under the auspices of the, um, uh, the law here, that this policy was never in place to begin with. So travelers said, hey, we're going to refund all the premiums that they paid to us because we're just going back to square one here. Now, can this be risky for the insurance company to do this? Yes, rescission of policies is actually fairly rare, uh, which is kind of unique. Declinations of coverage, I think, are generally more common. But in this case, you'll see, hey, there was allegedly an issue with just material facts stated on the uh, the actual application itself. So insurance companies, when they rescind policies, I mean, that's a big deal. Courts don't necessarily look upon that too kindly, neither would juries. And so there's something called a bad faith claim that can arise from this. So typically speaking, when an insurance company goes this far, they are very particular about making sure all of their ducks are in a row. Generally, they're going to get some outside law firm to actually come in, assess everything in accordance with the policy language and make this outside third party uh, type of matter. So they're, the insurance company, it's not just people in house, they're also gonna rely on people outside uh, to try and avoid any conflict of interest that could later pop up in a bad faith claim. Now, bad faith claims, not only does it just make the insurance company look bad, but also leads to big dollar punitive damages plus attorney's fees and all kinds of stuff. So. With that, what you need to understand if you're a company and you have cyber insurance is it's one thing to have a claim denied, right? Generally, that's like a policy language issue. When you're looking at something such as a rescission of policies, that's when insurance companies go, okay, you've lied to somebody before. This is not a risk we're willing to take, right? Because of the possibility of a bad faith claim. So, in the case of ICS, if this comes to fruition and it turns out the travelers um, is actually correct in the rescission of the policy and the court gives them everything they want, they are going to have an exceedingly difficult time getting any cyber insurance. All right. That's my projection there that no cyber insurance company is going to want to touch them. Um, this company, I looked it up, I believe they're roughly 25 million in revenue. That is not big enough to move the needle. So if you're a smaller company 
and you end up with a rescission of a cyber policy, um, good luck is all I have to say to you. Um, I don't even know if I could help you with all the contacts I have in the cyber insurance world and all the knowledge I have uh, rambling around my brain here every day. If you get a policy rescission, you're going to have a very, very difficult time. You, you're probably just best off trying to self-insure that risk. So thoughts on the case here. Now, the premium was, I think, roughly like $25,000 for a million-dollar policy. These guys may have just lost a million-dollar policy. So travelers, you know, are they a good company? Are they a bad company? I don't know. They're a company, right? They're not like a moral actor. Um, but I think they're smart. They wouldn't do this unless they're trying to set case law, make an example, because now this is in all the insurance journals. Two, they want to limit losses to their cyber book of business. So could this become more rare or I'm sorry, more common? Yeah, absolutely. Why? Cyber insurance companies are just getting smashed with losses. So if they can find a way to try and limit that loss, I don't know how much the cyber claim, uh, that ransomware claim was that I don't think that was anywhere in the court documents, but of course they're going to try and save that money. I bet it was more than $25,000. And I think they probably have pretty sturdy ground to stand on. So th there's no uh, reply yet from ICS. I'm sure they're working through that. Just from what's currently said on uh, the allegations made by travelers, and they got really sturdy ground to stand on. I think it's going to be very hard uh, to try and claw that back. And I'm really just guessing the travelers is going to win. Just looking at this, thinking about all the case law that I've read over the years, this looks really bad for ICS. Now, with that, here's some, some things I think everybody needs uh, moving forward here. So applications are everyone's problem, all right? It involves every single part of your organization. So this includes technical, administrative, physical safeguards and controls. I write about it more in my book. You'll see that here in a second. This is not just the IT guy's problem, all right? We need to get businesses out of that mindset where, hey, cyber application comes in, you send it over to the IT guy, CEO signs it, goes back to the insurance guy. That's not the way to do it, all right? So there are times where, the IT guy or the MSP, whoever you have, maybe he just doesn't know, right? So now you're asking him to um, make attestations on wire transfer protocols, right? Maybe that's really the CFO's job or maybe that's the CEO's job. He, the IT guy probably isn't transferring a lot of money around, so he just wouldn't even know. So don't just solely rely on the IT guy uh, to make that happen, okay? Now, you have to understand that definitive questions require definitive answers. And you saw that previously in the actual application that ICS uh, sent over to travelers, all right? So keep in mind, insurance policies, these are legal contracts. You wouldn't just, you know, pencil whip a legal contract, uh, but somehow people have this idea that insurance applications are just, you know, something that they have to do amongst all the other things they do, right? This is serious business. Do you make sure you're doing this appropriately? Next. If you have a definitive question, that requires a definitive answer. Some of those questions may be impossible for you to answer, right? It depends on the organization, but sometimes they're going to say, hey, yes or no. And for example, are you HIPAA compliant? I mean, that's a very difficult question to answer. Are, is anybody ever 100% compliant with all the laws that could potentially affect their business? Very, very difficult to answer. So... An example, another one would be, hey, are you applicable with all state and federal cybersecurity and privacy laws? How in the hell are you going to know that? Um, I don't even think most attorneys in the cyber law sphere could give you that type of definitive answer of a yes or no, because some of these laws, they're still being developed. So, hey, maybe you're compliant today, tomorrow, some new law comes out and suddenly you are not in compliance with, with that anymore. Or... Maybe there's a ruling that really kind of narrows down what some fuzzy language in that law actually means and suddenly you're not compliant anymore. All right. So please make the broker and the underwriters think. All right. So, you know, it's very easy for me just to pass paperwork back and forth. That's not what you pay me for. That's not what my clients pay me for. Right. We should be adding value here. So please, you can always just add an addendum. What would that addendum be? Hey, you got this question, it's a 100% yes or no, and you're sitting there and you're going, you know, maybe it's 99% yes, 
but you want to add that clarification to the underwriter to put the legal onus. You're trying to put it back on them, right? So if it's a sort of, a kind of, a maybe, really dig into that addendum, right? Likewise, if you don't understand a term they are using, push that back to the broker, make sure the underwriter is defining that term appropriately. If the underwriter can't define the term appropriately, uh, you got bigger problems, all right? So please make sure you're leaning back on that system that's not just there to take your money and talk to you once a year, it's there to support your business, all right? Keep in mind, most brokers, and it pains me to say this, they have no idea what they're selling. They've never read the policy. They're never going to read the policy. Uh, I think it's something like 92% of insurance guys leave within the first two years. So they don't even really necessarily have the time under their belts to even figure out what's important or not. All right. So unfortunately for you know the preponderance of businesses out there, it's going to be very difficult to lean on your insurance guys. So most likely what's going to happen is you're going to have a question, right? The client's going to go to the broker. The broker's going to go to the underwriter. Then it goes all the way back down the chain. Okay. So that's most likely what's going to happen. I wish I could tell you there was more support there um, on the agent and broker side, but frankly, we don't uh, attract a lot of Mensa members. So sorry about that. All right. Next, think liability. All right. So if you are the person filling out this application, it's not your job to make someone look good. It's your job to be 100% forthright with your answer. Likewise, if you're an MSP and you're getting a cyber insurance application, all right, it's not your job to make them look good. Very few businesses are going to have everything checked as a yes, even the largest businesses I've ever dealt with. All right, so please keep that in consideration. As I said before, be 100% forthright in your answers. You know, you got to think about your insurance, their insurance, their premiums. It's a delicate dance, and I understand that, all right? But you always just have to tell the truth. Most commonly, that's going to be in an addendum or asking clarifying questions. If you're filling this application out, you're probably not going to have all the answers, and that's okay, all right? I have seen more than one circumstance where the IT guy was in charge of just procuring cyber insurance and filling out the application. That's just asking for disaster, right? Because the IT guy isn't going to know how concerned the CFO is with some type of social engineering scheme. The IT guy isn't going to know if the CEO is really worried about reputational harm or not worried at all. Likewise, the CEO isn't going to know if the IT guy is worried about uh, crypto jacking events or bricking coverage or something to that effect. So this is something where it really takes the entire team to fill out that application. All right, so you're going to have organizational, technical, policies, procedures, legal, and compliance. All of those parts could touch a business. You need to make sure the people responsible and knowledgeable in those areas are assisting with that application. All right, if you want to see another example of something like this, uh, Columbia uh, Casualty v. Cottage Health is another kind of famous case in this area. All right, so on that application, take this as an opportunity. It's not just the daily drudgery that you got to fill out yet another insurance application. I know they're not fun, but use this as an opportunity. Really start using it. Take those questions, delve into the controls, processes, procedures, potential regulations, compliance issues, all those things. This should be the time where you're getting all the right people in the room to fill that application out and you can actually start sitting down and you can start saying, okay, if the cyber insurance application is, for example, asking about all of these additional controls for wire transfers, we're checking no to all of this stuff. If they're asking about it, maybe there's something to that. Okay, so that's just one example, but there's a million other ways that can come into effect. All right, so moving forward, please plan ahead for that application. Make sure all the relevant parties are going to be in play there. Always be 100% forthright on the application. Consider those addendums to add clarification and try and minimize the odds you're going to be in trouble. And please do not solely rely on cyber insurance. Make sure you have that defense in depth at all times. As you can see in some of my other videos, uh, the cyber insurance market's getting spicy. So you don't necessarily just want to eschew all defenses 
and hope to God that you don't fall into this type of category. All right, if you're interested, hey, this is my latest book, Damage Control, Cyber Insurance and Compliance. If you've gotten this far down in the description, uh, you will see a link where you can download it for free. All right, with that, if you found this useful, you learned something today, uh, like, share, comment, subscribe, tell your friends, feed the algorithm. And with that, guys, stay safe.